Well, Chairman, in addition to the, um, the money which we hope um, the government will provide to the system through the Strategic Economic Plan, of course there are other slugs of money around the place, not least of which is a very significant amount of money which the government planned to um, invest in the Highways Agency. Um, as they become uh, an organisation that looks more like network rail, really, in terms of sort of five-year plans and committed finance at the beginning of that period, rather than the sort of stop-go, stop-go that we've seen for many, many years now. Um, we obviously are providing, um, through, the, uh, through the LEP, uh, details of schemes that really do need to be looked at on the main strategic highway network. Just to remind you, the strategic network in this county uh, comprises of the A11 as it passes through this county, the A14 for its entire link through the county, the A12 uh, from the Essex border up as far as Seven Hills Junction on the east side of Ipswich, and then north from the south portal, if you like, of, uh, of the Bascule Bridge or the south... Um, what is it? Not south a portal, side. is it? The south side of the Bascule Bridge up to Great Yarmouth. Um, and, and, of course, obviously across the county boundary there. So that's the strategic network. Um, in this document, or in the sort of supplements of this document, will be identified um, improvements to Junction 37 at Newmarket, um, all the Bury St. Edmunds junctions, 43, 44, and, and sorry, 42, 43, 44, uh, the Rookery Crossroads at, um, at uh, I've just mentioned there in terms of the Eastern Relief Road, um, then also Junction 55 at Copdock, Junction 57 at uh, Nacton, Junction 58 at, um, at Seven Hills, and indeed the Orwell Bridge itself all have a mention in this detailed list and, and with sig significant sums of money beside them. Uh, for instance, the Copdock Mill uh, would effectively require what's called a grade separation. Um, you know, uh, so that is budgeted at £100 million just at that location. So significant sums of money being um, asked for in that list. Okay, Councillor Burris. Yeah, I mean, I've just, I know it's, very, it's mostly ambition and aims and objectives and all those sorts of things. But I just wondered, you know, sort of as we move forward, whether more detail will emerge that we can actually build a picture in our minds as to what's actually happening on the ground. Because, you know, I think uh, some, some, I mean, this is a great piece of work, I have to say, but some, some of the documents can be rather woolly, and I'd like to see a bit more detail and maybe some more specifics, particularly which affects uh, us here in Suffolk. So, apart from that, a very good report. Thank you. I can come back on that. I mean, a lot of the information that we've got here is actually speculative at the moment. You know, we've been given indicative sums to bid for, uh, and we've tailored a programme of, of road improvements, um, uh, which we might like to see within that. We have no idea whether the government will actually will allocate that amount of money to these projects, uh, or indeed want some more. So that's why there's an extensive uh, list around. And the same goes for what I've just said about the Highways Agency. I mean, these are all thoughts at the moment. They're not actually um, enshrined in, 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 uh, in, in specific legislation or, or actual um, funding as we know it. So there's, there's some way to go yet, really, before we're in that place. But, of course, I thoroughly agree with Councillor Burroughs. I think we, as, as, as an organisation, should be pressing for clarity on that as soon as we can get it. And it probably won't be much before the end of this year before we do start to get that sort of detail rippling through. And I go back to my opening comments that... You know, this is but the starting point in the conversation. And I think it's a good, good starting point that we have. Now, I've only got two others, unless I've missed anyone. I've got Councillor Jacklin and Councillor Flood. Have I missed anybody out? Sorry, I didn't see that, Councillor Gage. Right. Councillor Jacklin, then Councillor Flood. Then, right, OK. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, this is just one or two things. I mean, it's a, a very comprehensive document, and I, I understand that uh, these are aspirational. Um, but one or two things I'm a little bit confused about, when it says on uh, page 85, 640, it says securing assisted status. Well, I notice, I think the chairman himself, uh, the leader of the council himself, has been on record as saying that this has already been secured. Um, can we clear that up? Is this an aspiration, or have we got that uh, area assisted status? I thought that had been secured. Okay, that's, that's the... Um, that's that particular thing. Then we go on to flood risks, um, and I, I address this to Councillor Smith. Um, it, it, 
we're not sure. We keep getting different conflicting statements of how far the flood defence um, project for Lowestoft is being um, advanced. It, it just seems to me that uh, there are conflicting statements. Some people saying that there's studies underway. Some people that say that money is yet to be, a, uh, uh, to be allocated. If you could just clear that up for us. Again, it comes under aspirations. Um, and then we come to the third river crossing. Now, it says quite clearly here in this document, and again, it's a draft document, it talks very clearly about the third river crossing. Again, and Councillor Newman said it this morning, uh, we, we use different terminology. We call it an alternative crossing, and we call it a replacement crossing. Um, the people of Loistoft want a third river cross crossing, and, and, and um, I want to make sure that that's on record. Um, finally, um, I'm concerned that we, we seem to have um, lost our way a little bit because um, this morning, as we all know, the um, manufacturing base for Siemens is going to go to Humberside. Uh, we, we in Lowestoft and Great Yarmouth were rather hoping that we would have a shout at that, and I think um, we lost that opportunity when the old system um, died or was murdered and the new one came into, into being. Um, it just seems a shame that there's probably a thousand jobs that we could have had there that have disappeared. Um, perhaps, uh, I know there are different people to comment on that, Mr. Chairman, but perhaps um, we could have some enlightenment on those issues. Well, I'll kick off when I give others a chance to think on these issues. Um, I mean, remember, this is the LEPS document, and we are being asked to, to comment on that. And I think um, what you have in here is an awful lot of uh, a terminology. And if I come on to the river crossing or the crossing over Lake Lothing, really, to be more accurately, um, it's not just about confining itself to a third crossing or any other thing. It is basically around a new crossing over Lake Lothing. And I think that, to my mind, is what the people of Lowestoft are looking for. What ends up and what materialises is going to really be a subject of what we're going to do and we've committed ourselves to do as a cabinet to look at the feasibility study of that. And I think the subject of that will be more than gone through in the conference in a couple of weeks' time up in Lowestoft, which will look at some of the options that are already in uh, the Lowestoft uh, transport infrastructure document. But I think on the, uh, some of the, the, the wider stuff that, uh, that, that you've uh, contributed to about, say, the area, assisted area status, my understanding is that this has been agreed in principle and that we are waiting for details to come back on that. And um, I'm correct in that statement, aren't I? Yeah. Okay. Now, who would like to pick up on... Some... Well, uh, yes? Yep. Chairman, if, if I may, uh, you're absolutely right what you've just said about assisted area status. It's not quite there, although all the indications are is that it will apply uh, to Lowestoft. It's, of course, that kind of thing, assisted area status, which will help business in Lowestoft. You, uh, Councillor Jacklin mentioned about uh, Siemens. I've only heard this morning on the news that there's a thousand extra jobs being provided in Hull. I'm not aware that's at the cost of a thousand jobs in Lowestoft. I mean, I think it's good news for Hull. Uh, it would have been better news if we had it in Lowestoft, but it's still good news for, the, for, for sort of UK PLC. Um, and what I can say about the flood defence scheme for Lowestoft is it is still within the exploratory um, phase because it's a complicated business with the flood coming in from the North Sea directly and round the back through Braden Water and up through Alton Board. And we have to understand exactly what happens so that the uh, flood defence barrier, when built, and I say when built because it will be built, uh, is effective. Now, the cost of that at today's prices is likely to be around... £40 million. Pounds. Uh, don't quote me on that, but that's, a, that's the, the li likely area. Some of that will come through this plan, through the LEP, but there will be a need to find match funding on a big scale. I don't think there's anything more to add on, the, on the, cr the crossing issue, because after all, we are looking at a situation, I think, in which uh, there is a time expiry point at some point on the Bascule Bridge. Um, there's also the possibility of Associated British Ports wanting to expand their port endeavours. There's all sorts of things there, which is why I think we should keep it at this stage to a, 
a further crossing, a new crossing, an additional crossing, uh, not necessarily replacement, not necessarily third. Councillor Flood, next then, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, as a representative of what will shortly be the third largest town in Suffolk, you'd expect me to say there is not enough emphasis on the 1307 and the development of the biotech highway between Haverhill and Cambridge. It's a vital area of growth. We have lots of houses coming. We have a young demographic and we will be an ideal place to grow. I'd like to see more emphasis on that. Now we come to a slightly less fortunate bit. Um, Councillor Murray, I think it was, uh, the physicist, and somebody mentioned the Chihuahua of Doom. I know it sounds very amusing, but if you close Suffolk down, we all stop breathing, driving cars and everything, and heating our houses. You see the card in front of you? On the left-hand side, there's about an inch, slightly more, but three-quarters of that. If you close Suffolk down, put your finger on the top and move it down three-quarters of an inch. That is how much contribution Suffolk is going to make in the next 80 years to global warming. All of it. We have here on page 35, T05, we're going to put two million pounds into climate change. The low carbon economy, 809. 10 million pounds. About the same as we're going to spend on innovation. Could I suggest that the money will be better spent on innovation? And now I will recruit Councillor Murray. He will explain to you the Millikan oil drop experiment and its part in the history of science, where when the science was wrong, it took years, and people very gently sidled up to reality. The latest IPCC report has, for the first time, begun to lower the transit climate sensitivity number. It has abandoned its authority over what the equilibrium climate sensitivity is. Please, I beg of you, this is where the eco-friendly rubber hits the pothole road. Any money spent on these things is money wasted. You will regret it. In 10 years' time, you will say, I wish we'd spent it on something else. Have the courage to spend it on something else now. Thank you, very, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm so glad we're recording this meeting. I think no one would quite believe that. There we go. Um, right, who wants to um, pick the bones out of that lot, as they say? Right, Councillor Newman. Hopefully we'll help the, uh, the, the clerk who's minuting the meeting to be able to go back to the audio recording. When Councillor Flood started off there, he was a representative of the third largest. I thought he was going to use the word party after that, but um, it was town he was talking about. So there we are. Um, anyway, the thing is this, that... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I was talking about the sort of, you know, the, the data that underpins all this lot. And, of course, um, Haverhill roads themselves in terms of the potential for three and a half or possibly more uh, thousand um, houses in the northeast and northwest of Haverhill uh, will be a prime concern of this organization because that's in Suffolk. The issue of the 1307 though of course uh, we only have a very small proportion of the 1307 in this county but we have started some studies with Cambridgeshire County Council uh, to analyse um, traffic behaviours coming out of Haverhill and going on that route out via Bartlow and Linton and that I think will determine where, how we refine a strategy for the future on both the 1307 itself and, and any other uh, transport modes we want to look at going forward. But, I'd just like to make it absolutely clear that although it's not mentioned in those top seven schemes, it's certainly a commitment of this county council, and that's been very uh, roundly represented, uh, represented at the local enterprise partnership. 
Right, I think we had some issues around alternative energy, didn't we? And uh, Councillor Smith, you're well, reaching I'll, for I'll the... I'll be uh... brave, <laughs> shall I I'd, I'd try and say a few words on this. I think uh, the report really is focused around pages 57 to 59, where we're talking about business resource efficiency, making businesses, uh, bringing their costs down, making them more efficient, more able to compete in the world. And I think the uh, figures that... Uh, um, Councillor Flood referred to on page 35 are all part of that effort. Uh, privately, Councillor Flood knows that my views about climate change are not uh, in the mainstream, uh, so I do have some sympathy with him, but being responsible for the green environment, uh, I see many instances where we can go into companies, audit what they do, and really come up with some really substantial suggestions of how their energy bills can be cut in many ways as much as 50%. And I think if this scheme is going to help encourage that work, then we must support it. Make them more efficient, isn't it? Right, we've got um, Councillor Gage, Councillor Sylvester, Councillor Beer is gone. Oh, well, he may come back. Right, Councillor Gage next then, please. Thank you. I just really wanted to pick up on what I feel is a, a gap in this document. I appreciate it's um, a strategic economic plan, but it does, within Chapter 8, um, refers to um, housing development, um, and also earlier on in the, in the document refers to where are um, tourism and other um, economy um, generators, as it were, are along the um, East Coast, for instance. Um, and so it seems to me that what we've not got here is any, any real support of um, the need for um, affordable or social housing in any, in any real sense in those areas. Um, it seems to rely entirely on, on um, planning authorities to enable that to happen. And yet we see, um, we see already some planning applications which come forward that do not contain social housing within them and, and go ahead. This is an area where we have, and again it's recognised in this document, lower wages. If we are ever going to see sustainable development in a lot of our rural areas um, and be able to have young people have independence in terms of housing, given the um, wages that they are on, I cannot see how this, this document will help to generate the economic development, which is, in, in theory, trying to, to say will happen. Um, so I'd like um, an answer on that. And alongside that, as you'd expect from me, is the issue around um, transport. Though, obviously, again, this is strategic, so a lot of the um, transport which is listed in here, schemes are of a significant nature on our major routes. There is nothing in here that supports beyond those our transport links to our more rural towns that are equally as important in terms of generating um, the economy in the future. I'm going to tackle the first one now first. I mean, what, what has been very interesting um, in the discussions we've had on the LEP is that, um, of course, Councillor Ellesmere from Isridge Borough and um, the leader of Norwich City Council who sit on the LEP have not actually raised any of these issues about affordable housing when we have looked through the detail of this. I mean, the, the great sort of mention of affordable housing, I think, has been, was a sort of part of the Norwich uh, City deal bid, but I think that that was found to be quite a weakness in their bid at the time, which is why it didn't move forward. Because, as you point out, Councillor Gage, the economies in this is about house building, and really the issue is around um, boroughs and districts and their planning to look at, uh, look at housing, and that, that is correct. But I'm not aware that Councillor Ellesmere has actually raised this um, as an issue that he wanted to see in the... Um, in, in this document, and of course he, like myself, is a member of, of the, the left. Do you want to come back on that? I, with, with respect, I didn't mention Ipswich. I was talking about rural areas where I think um, we are letting our um, towns and villages down in that um, a lot of our districts are not um, forcing through affordable housing as, as part of the applications. Well, I, I, I'm happy to be challenged on that, but I, do, I have heard of examples where a development is going ahead without a fair um, volume of, of um, affordable housing. But in Ipswich, we have a different approach, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, which may explain why Councillor Ellesmere didn't feel the need to mention it, because we are building affordable houses in their hundreds in Ipswich. 
And, that's, and that was the whole point. And that, you know, is not seen as a key economic driver, which is what this document is all about. And it's not really the subject of this document to get into that sort of detail. But, you know, I look to Councillor Smith and Lucy, if there's anything you want to add to well, that. Chairman, I'm not an expert on housing, but there is a section within uh, this uh, uh, document, pages 103 to 104, on affordable housing. Uh, and uh, I think that's the basis we should go forward on. But I agree again with Councillor B that this is the starting point. You know, I don't think uh, we can expect more than that. And uh, I think it should, what, what is said uh, about affordable housing is welcome. I so answered all of your points, Councillor Gage, because you raised an issue about transport, didn't you? Yeah. I think in, in terms of other places likely to be mentioned here in terms of, of major road improvements, probably Sudbury is in that list, um, but not a lot more than what I've actually already told you of. Um, so Newmarket and, and Sudbury are in there as, as aspirations. But be interested to know of the particular locations that Councillor Gage is thinking of. Um, I can confirm whether or not uh, we've got anything up our sleeve in terms of those. I was, I was primarily thinking about some of our market towns. I, and again, I do appreciate that this is a strategic economic plan, but there surely needs to be a link between what's contained in here and how it, how it will provide those transport links to the rest of the county. You will know that while, you know, our, our, our bus service is, is um, depleting, our scheduled bus services across much of Suffolk, and yet we seem to be relying entirely upon volunteers and community transport um, schemes to provide the, um, the, you know, the, the filling in those gaps. And that surely isn't enough in terms of um, economic growth in those areas. And we're not just talking about strategic um, routes here. We need to have a connection between what we've got in, in this document and how it's envisaged that it will um, provide for um, uh, you know, transport links across the county. Now, I don't expect this to, to list them all, obviously, because it's a strategic document. But what I'm not seeing in here is how it all knits together. Right, well, in this um, document, I think there's very little about sort of interurban bus routes, um, uh, Leader, and I, actually I don't think you would expect in a strategic document of this sort. I mean, there are obviously issues about local transport which we've got to work through, not least of it, some of us in this room getting out of our cars and getting into some public transport of some sort or the other. Um, I think I'm about the only person who's currently actively doing that, but still we'll go, we won't go there. Um, that is the, the key issue. That is the reason why our bus services are being depleted, is because nobody's using them and those who are using them are on concessionary passes the bus companies get remarkably little reimbursement for um, an adult fare when it's covered by a concessionary pass um, something like a third somewhere between a third and a half of the full adult fare so you've got the situation in parts of the county where um, we, we've got supported buses which people say are full but actually the money that's getting coming back into the system for those actually doesn't cover the cost of running them uh, just a quick comment. I think uh, it, the comments are a little unfair. One, uh, we have to go to government with this plan, and it's a competitive process. We're not guaranteed funding. We don't know how much funding we'll get. And, and two, in my opening remarks, I did say we're working now on a delivery plan, but we need to put the flesh on the bones of that delivery plan when we know what we're likely to get from government. And I think that's the time your criticisms could be valid. The beginning of the, op of the conversation, isn't it, as, as we've said. Right, Councillor Sylvester is next then, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, thumbing through this report, and it's very comprehensive, I found Brandon. Brandon's my town. Six lines, about 50 words. And yes, it, we do have a huge development on the cards to put a private sector road through there. But sadly, the, the idea of the developer is to put a single carriageway road through there, and he is asking for planning consent for 2,500 2, homes. 
and I would suggest to you that 2,005 homes on a single carriageway road would create more congestion than we already have in Brandon. On top of that, the Chief Executive of uh, Network Rail Eastern Section came along and said that, yes, he was very happy to be part of this uh, uh, development, and he would donate a million pounds towards the cost of building a bridge. I'm, I'm really telling you this just to make the Cabinet aware of what's on offer there, because the report is a bit vague there. He would denote donate a million pounds towards the building of a bridge over the so-called relief road. He said it would be very beneficial to network rail because he could then close the level crossing. So not only are we going to get 2,500 homes on a road that won't carry, carry the traffic, but they're proposing to turn Brandon High Street into a cul-de-sac because if you close the level crossing at the bottom of the high street and the bridge over the relief road is a mile down the road somewhere I, I, don't, I just don't know what it would do to Brandon first of all it will murder all the businesses there and leave us with so much congestion with traffic that can't get through either from, from North Norfolk down through, through Suffolk and, and onto the A11 I, I just can't see the sense of that and I think you need to know what this developer is actually requiring because he is going to fund that carriageway, that single carriage. Thank you, Chairman. Dr. Dr. Smith. Uh, can I just inform Cabinet and others that I do know about this because it's the duty of my officers to brief me on such things and I have been thoroughly briefed on the proposals for the 2,000 houses at Brandon and the, and the, the roads. Um, but it's all very, very early stages. We're not happy at all with what the developer is bringing forward. And there have been our initial comments, but we are at an early stage there. And I understand the problems at Brandon. I don't particularly want to talk about the road issues because it's not my area. But how that relates to a, a housing development of a very big scale, I do understand. And what's more, I'm looking forward to coming to Brandon, I think, at the end of April to have a look at the country park. And I should look at other things while I'm there. And I will try and involve you, Councillor Silver. I'm sure um, you'll have a, a super day there because it's a, it's a lovely country park. I've uh, done the tour myself. I think we don't, I mean, really, do you want to? Because very Actually, it's quite an important point. Actually, I don't think it's much £1 million, Councillor Sylvester. It's £8 million has been volunteered by, um, by the managing director of uh, Network Rail in this area. Um, but this, I think, you know, we had a public meeting on this. I was present, uh, as indeed was your Member of Parliament there. Um, there's a very clear action plan at the moment to um, redo the signage um, uh, on the A11 at Milden Hall um, to divert um, through traffic to the likes of Swaffham and beyond into West Norfolk via the A11 when, it's, when the dual carriageway opens later this year. And um, it goes via Thetford up the A134. does no longer come through the town. That's probably probably the time to do the sort of traffic analysis to see who is using what. I completely take the point that you're making that if you close the level crossing, which of course is a condition of Mr. Wall's £8 million, um, uh, then that does make the cul-de-sac a high, um, uh, sorry, the high street a cul-de-sac and would have some um, implications for the town. As in terms of the engineering of the road, well, clearly it's the whole point of making any sort of agreement with the developer would be that the road isn't of appropriate capacity to accommodate the traffic that uh, you want to pass over it. I think the bigger hurdle we've got to get over is the fact that at the moment, as far as the Forest Heath uh, LDF is concerned, only 750 to 1,000 houses are envisaged in the area that you're talking about. Um, and so, therefore, 2,500 is a little bit sort of uh, bigger than was anticipated. Anticipated, even if you levied £1,000 for each house specifically to go towards the relief road, um, that would only bring you in £2.5 uh, £2 million. The cost of this road altogether is envisioned at £25 million. So, therefore, there's a long, long way to go yet. And as the leaders, I think, quite, quite yes, on a number of occasions so far today, this is very much curtain raiser. The main thing is. It's in the scheme of things. People understand the problem, and there's a lot more work to do before there's a scheme ready to be delivered there, which no doubt will involve your good self in representing the people of Brandon. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Councillor Newman. And as you say, this is a 
curtain raiser, but we need to agree it before the curtain comes down on the 31st of March. So I've got no other questions or comments that I'm aware of from members uh, who are present. So I'd like to go back to Cabinet. The recommendation, you've got two recommendations there on page 19. Is Cabinet happy to agree and endorse this plan? All agreed? Thank you very much indeed. Item 7, Admission Arrangements to Schools in Suffolk 2015-2016, Council Chambers. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the report that we've got before us today seeks approval for the arrangement um, for the school year 2015-2016 and is set out in recommendations um, 1 to 6 in front of you. This year, the annual consultation has been um, successful in engaging with parents over 400 responses were received, um, nearly 99% of those from parents. The, questions, um, the question that interested um, most parents was whether we should continue um, to admit children with a sibling at attending a school before the school um, before children um, from the school catchment area. And this is detailed at um, paragraph 41. 69% 69 of, respond 69 of the respondents supported um, this order of priority for places, so we propose no change. We also consulted on whether the County Council um, should cease to handle admissions to existing year groups for academies, free schools, voluntary aided and foundation or trust schools. Two thirds of those um, who expressed a view supported this change and again this is set out in paragraph 43 of the report. We believe this change is a pragmatic one, um, given that there is no longer a legal requirement to coordinate these in-year applications. The County Council will still receive applications from community and controlled schools and will help any parents who struggle to find a place for their child um, or indeed understanding what is rather a complex system. Um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions and, and I think the report is a very detailed report and clearly sets out um, the process. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Chambers. Questions or comments from Cabinet members first, please. Councillor Newman. I have to just um, say, following what Councillor Chambers has just said about these admission arrangements for siblings, um, during my time as Cabinet Member for, for Children and Young People, um, there was a protracted campaign by our Members of Parliament of, for parents who found it extremely difficult to get um, two of their siblings to different schools for the same opening time. And we do expect parents to be responsible for getting their children to school and it was for that reason we introduced that change um, during the last administration and I'm very glad to hear that Council Chambers has accepted it should go forward like that um, even though of course it does bring with it a problem and, and you know 30% of the respondents have said no we would rather it that um, if the school is next door to us we could get priority but once you've started that process you cannot expect good attendance you have to um, uh, make arrangements really for the siblings to go to the same school. And I think there's social reasons for doing that as well as sort of operational ones as well. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Okay. Other members of the council present? Councillor Burroughs first, Councillor Lockington, then Councillor Finch. Yeah, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just uh, in reference to the um, admission criteria that's contained within the schools in Suffolk brochure, I think we mentioned at uh, a scrutiny meeting, I think it was last last year, wasn't it, in the autumn, I think one of my, probably one of my first scrutiny committee meetings that I attended, and that was where there was confusion potentially or, or the detail within it could be misread. I think we just wanted to underline future-proofing that document so parents know exactly where they are, what options are open to them, and they don't get confused about the admissions procedure and or what they can and can't do. And I think obviously the siblings issue and the catchment issues um, just need to be... Uh, uh, firmed up a bit. So I'm happy um, if you're going to take that forward and include that in the brochure to make it almost foolproof. Thank you. Councillor Lockington next, then, please. Thank yes, Councillor. just um, I think it is a good thing to try 
to do our best to keep siblings together. I know it can create problems, you know, because if one year you have children with a lot of siblings sort of coming and so on, you know, so it can create problems. But for the individual family, it is easier to get children to the same school. And just a little comment on page 184 on the pan. Um, I'm a county council governor at St. Margaret's in Ipswich, and certainly last summer, September, we took in 60 children. We will be taking in 60 this September. So it is not only in 15, 16, we will go up to 60, but we did it as part of the request for increase, the places in Ipswich. So just to be sure that somebody somewhere knows that we are on the list for 60. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to raise uh, Councillor Chambers, my hobby horse. Um, I know this paper, paper doesn't refer specifically to primary schools, but I'd like to point out to Cabinet and her that I think the whole placing of children in primary schools is even more important than secondary school on the ability that they are younger children and they, they, you know, the ability of, of, of travelling further distances is less satisfactory. Um, we have had recent discussions clearly on local village schools and I would like to sort of encourage her to even think about a PDP specifically on what our future strategy for small local rural primary schools should be because um, I fundamentally uh, believe that they are, the, as I'm sure Mr. Whiffing will know, um, fundamentally they, they are part of the important infrastructure of any really small community. And we have started, you know, these challenges, and I would, I would ask very clearly. The statistics, I think, sometimes hide the truth. You know, my four primary schools, and I'm talking parochially, are all full. And we've got housing developments coming into there. I've seen the forecast from Mr. Whiffing because I've asked him for them. And sadly, sometimes it doesn't all work out. And I do get my ears bended fairly regularly at various parish meetings. What are you going to do, Councillor Finch, when they come into the village and they can't go in? I understand the rules and I've explained the rules to them and it's a very complex. I would suggest this paper is even more complex than the previous one, actually. Um, and we've got a, quite a challenge, haven't we? So I just think we need to perhaps have that thought process, declare are we going to be supporting small primary schools as a very clear point of policy and how are we going to develop a strategy which will, could be met in the context and the constraints of our financial uh, position going forward. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Chambers. Um, I've had many conversations with Councillor Finch on place planning, um, as he knows. So, um, Yes, I think I'd be more than happy to um, put forward um, his suggestion to um, the chairman of the Education PDP, Education Children Services PDP, um, for, for that to go on the forward plan. So I will have a conversation with Councillor Jones about that. Councillor Martin, next. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, one of the biggest problems I think that you're going to have with any planning for schools, whether it be for places or anything else, is that with the policy on free schools, uh, people can just decide to start schools wherever they feel like, whether there's any justification for them, any demand for them, uh, whether there's already an oversupply of places, and so on. Um, it, can you tell us whether there are any proposals in the pipeline for free school primary schools other than the ones that we already know about? Um, we're not aware of any um, free school primaries coming forward, um, although I do have to um, just alter a little bit of what Councillor Martin said in terms of um, the capacity in an area around a free school. The DfE would take that capacity, capacity planning into consideration when granting the free school. Don't go there, Councillor Martin, don't go there. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Nice one. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We move to the recommendations. You'll find them on page 113, 1 to 6. Can I ask if Cabinet's happy to agree? All agreed? Thank you very much indeed. 
Our final item, item number eight, home care and community meals. Um, you'll find this uh, report on page 189, and I invite Councillor Murray now to speak to it. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, this paper seeks uh, Cabinet approval, really, to delegate authority to the Director of ACS really to conduct a, a tender for support to live at home. This is on a social work team aligned locality basis and to support new and existing customers to purchase hot meals through providers and community opportunities. Um, basically, the current time and task model we have for home care is relatively inflexible and, and frankly, a relatively uncompassionate way to deliver care. And this paper describes the uh, next steps in arranging home care on a locality basis and improvements to our community meals provision. As you know, Cabinet gave uh, assent to the Director of, of ACS to review the provision back in July of last year, and in September, Cabinet agreed to formal consultation and market engagement plans. This report before you today is from Anna McCready, John Lewis, and particularly Robin Guy, I must thank for his, uh, his, his great efforts in, in, uh, in enormous organisational and analytical uh, terms for, for getting it all together. Not an, not an easy task. Uh, public consultation was held and is summarised in paragraph 37 in front of you and a market engagement meeting was held with uh, uh, 80 providers, both statutory and non-statutory. Uh, it's fair to say home care has been organically growing and evolving over the years with some single large providers, other smaller providers, some having a very wide geographic spread and this is bringing its own problems of recruitment, uh, retention problems, travelling for carers, handbacks to our in-house home first arrange, uh, uh, care arrangements when things fail. Um, it's uh, difficulty, difficulties. The current budget uh, is 28 million with demand increasing, some 11% in the last year, but with some com commensurate decrease in residential care, which is, is what we want to see and is what residents want to see if they want to stay at home. Um, we have some 60 home care providers currently uh, uh, with arrangements with us. 85% uh, of our care, although it is with uh, 20 of them. The aim, as I suggested, is to reorganise home care on a locality basis uh, with a lead provider in each of those localities, uh, really in line with our CCG uh, GP colleagues and our so social work uh, rearrangements uh, allied to our Supporting Lives and uh, Connecting Communities uh, project across Suffolk, which all aims to reduce the so social isolation and promote continued enablement and independence. And we are moving from a time and task to a much better outcome-based care planning system and the creative use of personalised budgets. Now, this will have to be a phased implementation if Cabinet agrees, and there will have to be significant compatible IT developments with the providers or by the providers so that a decent interface is, uh, is made with the ACS systems. Collaboration between companies may well be necessary and indeed subcontracting perhaps, and this too will require careful management of quality. It must be noted that the forthcoming 2015 Care Bill will require councils develop, to develop a wide-ranging market, and this is part of that process. Workforce development is also important and will need to play a major part. And now turning to community meals, the engagement day had 20 providers attending uh, discussions and the key points are listed in paragraph 64. And in brief summary, uh, we want to move to a locally sourced and prepared option and where this is not feasible to provide uh, a proper frozen uh, alternative. Uh, thank you very much. Very pleased to take questions. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Murray. We have uh, questions, first of all, from Cabinet members. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, open it up for other members of the Council. I think, Councillor, until you were first, weren't you? Thank you, Chairman. Um, what we've got here is an essential move away from today's inflexible and costly system of care delivery, uh, a system, incidentally, that often doesn't meet our residents' needs, um, to a fresh and newly designed service that will be based on individual choice, based on need, and outcomes for our residents, and most importantly, in a way, based on local solutions and locality working. The transition from one system to the other is not going to be a simple process. And so to help it all along, um, the Health and uh, Adult Care Policy Panel will be focusing on a number of aspects of the process in the coming months. And one of these is specifically referred to in point 22 in the paper in front of you. 
This new way of working will ask more of our providers, and specifically it will ask more from the care workers that are at the very heart of the system. It's therefore arguable that these workers, who are actually amongst the most poorly paid in our society, should receive the living rather than the minimum wage. Of course, there are issues of affordability here, and this is one of the things that the panel will be looking at very closely. But on the other side of the argument, there are very severe issues of uh, staff retention for many of these companies. And it is also the case that recognizing this, a number of our providers have already tried to move towards, away from paying the minimum wage and towards paying something closer to the living wage or even more. And in the panel, we will be seeking evidence from these providers to see how they are approaching this and looking quite closely at their cost, um, their cost bases, because what we don't want to see is that they pay people more and then take away um, funding from other areas of activity. In addition to this topic, which is a particularly knotty one, I think, um, we're also going to be looking at what we do about taking on obligations to support self-funders, what we do to build the community capacity, which will underpin the locality working, and what we do as a council to commission services that fulfill our statutory obligations while guaranteeing the very highest quality care for our residents. That means a lot of work to be done with providers. Um, in summary, this, this reorganization is a very complex challenge, but adopting a fresh approach shouldn't just improve life for those that we already care for, it should also increasingly help all our residents who will need care in the future. So I think that it's a really good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that positive start, uh, Councillor Antill. I've got uh, Councillor Lockington next then, please. Th thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got you I couldn't help remind myself on, we had a review in about 2000, was it five or seven or something? Uh, within that, the community meal was very much assessed with a toolkit in mind for its nutritional value. Um, I hope that we won't forget things like that when it comes to supporting people with, with meals in, in the community, that we still uh, you know, will have to look at what is the value, certainly if, if the public purse are paying. Um, I understand people's freedom to choose, but we need to be sure that our elderly people get a good nutrition meal. Uh, there was just a little something on page 190, number f uh, paragraph 15, on the very last line, or second, two last lines, it says that we need to commission services from providers who will build upon and harness the assets of families and their communities. Now, sometimes, in turn, we, when we talk about assets, I understand that to be money. And I just think, are we actually saying that we will get after the money of the families, or what sort of assets are we going to try and, and harness um, because uh, that was a, a little bit too, too much for me. Um, you know, and I got a bit of information about the home care and customers. Clearly in the last two years it looks as if we nearly got the same number. It stayed quite, um, you know, the same number of people using it, but the increase in hours has gone up slightly. So that clearly means that we have some people we are supporting in the community with, with more hours. But I still look forward to helping out, I think, with the piece of work that the um, policy committee will be doing, and it will be interesting to see what we learn there. Yes, thank you. Um even a mere surgeon understands the calorific content of food, but I agree, you make a very, very valid point. Um, it's in, very important that the quality, uh, not in terms of colour, uh, is important, but the content is more important than that. So, yes, thanks very much. Assets, I agree, it's open to uh, misinterpretation, that, that uh, word there. What we meant by that is social and community assets, not financial assets. I can reassure you on that point. And I agree that the numbers of meals that we're actually involved in is relatively small, only 600, given, our, given our, our, the demographics of uh, our services, but uh, nonetheless important to that uh, relatively small number. 
Thank you very much. Councillor Finch next, and then Councillor Burrows. Thank you, Mr Chairman. This is my last question for the day. Um, I welcome this paper. I think it's um, a very refreshing approach to something which a number of people have been talking about for some time, but I don't underestimate the logistics of getting from A to B. Um, I welcome the fact that there aren't any acronyms, or many, very few of them, but I was a little bit concerned about the jargon phrase asset-based conversations, um, which again was very similar to Councillor Lockington's comments. But I, I would just make one plea, is that there are some assets in rural communities which actually are, were, are still very bruised, having been sacked, I don't know how many years ago, and they would be a very good opportunity to be part of that community capacity. And if, if the PDP or whoever are going to talk about this, so for this transition, that we could actually include those good ladies that not only did they enjoy taking the food round voluntarily, they actually created a network and a relationship with those individuals who very often are mainly housebound. And I, would, I really implore that this strategy does can reconsider that particular opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. What was it? Asset based? Page 195. Yeah. Line. Asset based Conversation. conversations. I love that. That could be a BBC4 satirical programme, couldn't it? It really could. Councillor Murray. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, I'm reliably insured by my, the person on my right that it means not just filling the gaps, but building on strengths. Thank you. <laughs> Good succinct answer, as always. Councillor Burris, next then, please, and then Councillor Jacklin. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, certainly, I think this is a definite step in the right direction. I'm very pleased to, uh, to receive this report and, and, and go through it. Um, uh, until recently, we had a, where I live in Cheddar, we had a very elderly neighbour, 98-year-old, who lived on her own and um, sadly uh, the passage of time caught up with her and she did receive care and meals in her own home. The service she received was very good indeed and she was very pleased with that and we were pleased that she was getting it as her next door neighbour, having an interest in her welfare. Um, but I just wanted to ask about the... I'm glad to see we're moving away from uh, a time and task basis operation. I think that's uh, another uh, good step in the right direction. But I wanted to ask about um, the locality-based care approach. And I think one of the things we realized uh, with our neighbor situation was that the carers that were arriving always seemed to be in a rush and were slightly uncoordinated. And I wondered, are we actually fitting in uh, appropriate time for them to actually get to their next destination so they're not actually including that traveling time within their contractual obligations, whatever they might be, um, and also um, if it's going to be locality-based, which I think is a good idea, uh, if carers want to increase their hours, for example, will they have to travel longer distances rather than be based purely in their community? Right, Councillor Murray, please. Uh, thank you, Councillor Burris. Yeah, on the, on the first point, I think if, if we can go towards a locality organisation with, with the, uh, the providers, um, that must theoretically mean that if they had the same number of, of um, carers, they'd be travelling less far. So they'd be, less efficient, uh, they'd be more efficient, more face-to-face uh, -face contact. So uh, I think that would probably w work well. It might even mean that the, the providers would have a little bit more uh, um, revenue to, uh, to, to, to plough into workforce development and other things. Um, as for the second case, I'm not quite sure we can answer that here, but we will find out and, uh, and get back to you on that. Thank you. Councillor Jacklin, then Councillor Gage, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, if you use the U uh, UKHCA um, briefing notes, um, if we were to pay the living wage, what would be the, what would be the minimum price uh, of home care to SCC if we um, have the aspiration to match the uh, Cambridge one, which is uh, much, much lower uh, than the ones containing the briefing notes. And bear in mind that they're the briefing notes uh, from the organisation that run these places. Um, it, it perhaps something that, um, if you haven't done the calculations, perhaps the uh, uh, PDP could um, ask those questions. 
Councillor Murray. Thank you. Yeah, um, it is not an inconsiderable sum, as you might, might imagine, but, but individuals, individual companies in Suffolk so, certainly vary very widely in size, and it's going to affect each of those differently, depending on uh, the area they cover, the number of staff, etc. So it's, it's difficult to give an average, but it's, uh, you know, off the top of my head, it's going to be several millions if we were just to write a blank cheque. Not inconsiderable at all. Councillor Gay. Go on, Councillor Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just uh, inquiring uh, because we have aspirations to make it down to, to, to I think it's contained here, uh, 1350 to 1582 per hour. Uh, they're the aspirations uh, that, that uh, we would like to achieve, it says here. Um, and we have a current range of 13 to 18. And the um, UK... HCA say that the UK l l living wage minimum cost to them would be 18. So if we're going to start looking at rates of 15, then you know there's a big differential there, and I'm wondering how we can uh, whether Cambridge's um, value for money um, is, is somewhat incredibly out of the sink. Yeah, thank you. Well, I can't speak for Cambridge. Really. We put this there as an example of uh, something that is happening. Um, it's part of the work on, ongoing. I can't say how it's going to affect rural Suffolk at the moment, but uh, we, we thought we'd put in an example of uh, what somebody else says that they would try and attain. But I agree. Uh, you know, we've got two and two here, and they only, only make three and a half, so uh, it's, it's, it's a problem, potentially. However, bottom line is not finance. My bottom line, the reason I'm sitting here, it's the quality of the service we provide to the residents of, uh, of Suffolk. And uh, we will do our best within the financial constraints we have to provide a quality service. Right, Councillor Gage next, uh, then, please. Sorry, sorry. Can, um, sorry go can on. my director just add something to that? Um, I just wanted to also add to that that we do have providers in Suffolk currently who have moved to paying... Uh, the living wage to their staff at no additional cost to us. So one of the really important pieces of work as we continue to work with the market um, is spreading the good practice of some of those providers who've been able to do that and achieve that to those providers who are perhaps thinking that this might automatically mean more money. Um, and, of course, the kind of on costs, the way a business spreads its overheads is part of how we end up with the kind of hourly rate that gets charged to the council or to customers. So it's not a, it's not a simple direct piece of work from the figures quoted by, by that document. That's, that's kind of indicative um, behind the principles of the work we need to do. So we are very mindful that, that we have a cost envelope to work in but we've got really clear aspirations for improving quality. And a really important one is that the providers are focused on helping people to meet the goals that we set with those people to be met, rather than the half an hour visit to do whatever. Um, and building behind that the work through the policy development panel on, on consideration of that, that living wage um, discussion is going to be an important part of the journey um, but we do have quite a complex piece of work to complete around this. I've given you a full answer, I think. And that, Councillor Gage, next then, please. Thank you. I've got um, a couple of questions I just want to um, um, put to Councillor Murray. Um, the first one is around zero hours contracts. Um, I believe we've got some research published nationally today which suggests that there is substantial abuse of zero hours contracts in care work. Um, contracted um, by local authorities. So with that in mind, um, if we have worries about staff retention in this area, which I believe um, you, you in fact mentioned yourself in, on Radio Suffolk this morning, um, then why is this council not worried about um, zero hours contracts um, and um, looking, looking at that as one of the issues around retaining good quality staff um, and also looking at the concerns that a lot of staff have um, 
have mentioned on the travel costs, which in some cases they have to cover themselves. Um, in, in essence, um, why are we not looking at um, the staff work conditions um, as, as a key issue in, in retaining good quality staff? Um, and my, third question, uh, my second question rather, is, um, is around um, economy of scale. I think it's um, paragraph 32, which refers to 20 providers currently who provide 85% of the services. If that's the case, surely it would make sense then to look at um, exploring with those 20 providers how we can just expand the service so that they cover 100% of the services and not, not try to um, broaden it out and have more providers, because surely that's part of your um, um, aim with this is um, economy of scale. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, zero are contracts. I do worry about them. I agree. That's one of my jobs is to worry about them. Um, one of the reasons that people are, are awarded zero hour contracts is because a company often doesn't quite know if it's got the work coming in to cover the, to cover the people's jobs, isn't it? Now, if we're able to reorganize the system on a locality basis with a smaller number of providers, we're going to be, be producing a more efficient a way of the companies will work, uh, uh, the, 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 the companies would work, and therefore make their contractual arrangements with their staff theoretically somewhat better. And it is largely an individual choice sometimes to work on a zero-hour contract. Uh, some uh, um, people uh, have various other commitments, family, business commitments. They may choose to work, to work only sh short numbers of hours. So uh, um, that would be my answer to that. The second part of your question. Yes, 20 providers producing 85% producing of our services. Um, the problem is, with some of those providers, their geographical spread is not best placed in Suffolk to, to, to be easily reorganisable to our locality. So um, we have to look at all the providers, perhaps asking some providers to work together in particular localities to make things more efficient. Thank you. Do you want to come back then, briefly? Thank you. I'd like to come back on the first question I, I raised and um, your response to it on Zero Hours Contract. Um, I, I have to challenge your anecdotal response, if I may. Um, it's that you're right. Some people may choose to have Zero Hours Contracts because they have um, they've reached a time in their life when perhaps they do not need a regular income. But I am aware that many of our um, young carers that are in these jobs New 70, thank you, Councillor Martin. 75 percent do actually need a regular wage, and I myself am um, in the unfortunate position of had first-hand experience of what it's like to have a young person in my family on zero hours contract. They cannot make any real decisions in their lives. They cannot buy homes. They cannot rent homes because they don't know what their income is going to be on a weekly basis. So I would challenge your anecdotal response that it's you know it's okay because people actually like that flexibility. They don't. They need regular income and they need a, a proper standard of living. Yes, thank you. No, I, I would agree. They do need an income, and I, I agree. But we are not the primary employers. Um, we, we make agreements through a, a regionally agreed uh, contracting system um, to which all uh, local authorities uh, uh, adhere. Um, but I do take your point on board. It's not, I, I didn't need didn't mean to be flippant by my reply, and I hope I wasn't. And I perhaps was anecdotal, but uh, it is an important point. Thank you. Right, Councillor Martin, we'll make this the last one. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And no answer on travel costs. Uh, if somebody is uh, going from House A to House B during the course of their working day, why should they be not paid and why should they have to pay for their own petrol? Thank you, Mr Chairman. It's about agreeing a business model with, with the providers, really. Uh, we'll be looking at individual contracts and uh, individual arrangements with companies and uh, looking at, at the whole market and how things are run. It's part of our consultation. Thank you. So, can, Chair, can we, can we be uh, guaranteed that that will be looked into by the PDP alongside the living wage? That, sir, is entirely up to the PDP. Thank you, Mr Chairman. You'll have to wait and see, but I think um, the initial comments from uh, Councillor Antill were quite encouraging, I suspect, in that quarter, but you will have to see how the PDP operates. Right, thank you very much for your questions. We um, move to the recommendations. Members will find them on page 189 through to 90, uh, <coughs> 6 to 9. Can I ask if Cabinet are happy to agree? 
All agreed? Thank you very much indeed. You will be relieved to know that there are no urgent items of business. And the next time we meet will be on Tuesday the 29th of April, um, and we meet here in Endeavour House. And I now formally close the meeting. Thank you very much indeed.